Deborah Fisher was uh, part of the pioneering team in this uh, discipline uh, when the first discoveries were announced and uh, followed up. And she, since then, she's become a pioneer in her own right. She's uh, contributed quite a bit to our basic understanding of these exoplanets. Um, and she's also uh, concentrated quite a bit on teaching. And so I hope you'll recognize in her uh, not only a great scientist, but a great communicator. Today, she's uh, um, is going to grace us with a talk on following up on Alan's talk, which was a broader survey on searching for Earths in the Alpha Centauri system. Right. Deborah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, um, thanks especially to Alan for setting everything up so nicely. And I'm really kind of astonished at the observer theorist rivalry that he's set up. <laughs> But uh, let's see how this goes. Anyway, um, so I do, I, I, I'm an observer. I like to really visualize things. And so, um, you know, when there are questions like, what's the time scale of migration? Now I'm getting nervous. But anyway, I wanted to give you something to take back for your students as well. And I wanted to give you a little perspective. I know that not all of you teach astronomy. Some teach physics and, and math cl uh, classes as well. And so um, as we talk about extrasolar planets, it's so easy to like move on and discuss and throw out numbers like five Jupiter masses and three AUs without really having a good gut feeling for what those numbers mean. So that's what I'd kind of like to give um, to you and to my students. Of course, in our solar system, we've got eight planets, lots of rocky debris, which are, you know, the, you might call the terrestrial planets uh, rocky debris, uh, and asteroids. Most of the planets have moons, interestingly. And most of these planets are on at least nearly circular orbits. And uh, only one of the planets seems to be inhabited. And then uh, putting this on the scale of uh, the, the rocky planets, just throwing them all up, you can see that Venus is our near uh, sort of sister a sibling uh, planet, uh, nearly the same mass. And I am pretty sure that you'll hear from Jim Casting some interesting discussion about why it is that these three planets took such different evolutionary courses uh, in our solar system. And, and only one bears life now. And then also, just to give you some numbers, um, Jupiter is three, roughly 300 times the mass of the Earth. Uh, Saturn is a third that, 95 Earth masses, Uranus 14 Earth masses, and Neptune 17 Earth masses. So now you have a, a, a more, I think, I hope qualitative, quantitative sense to go along with the discussion. Um, one of the things that I like to do with students from kindergarten to fifth grade, and I still like to do this because I find it astonishing, is to think about the scale of the solar system. So we can do whatever we want to put up you know, pictures, and here's the, the diameter of this planet compared to that planet. But when you really think about the vastness of our solar system and how much empty space there is, um, to me, I find it quite staggering. And so one handy thing. Uh, one handy uh, way to scale up the solar system is to put things in terms of, uh, in units of the radius of the sun. So it turns out that scale to solar radii, you know, if, you, if we say this, the sun is a half a meter, okay, then the earth is about a, ha a half of a centimeter scale. It's about one hundredth that size. Okay, so the coffee bean earth picture. All right, and then the distance between the Earth's sun is about 100 meters, so 100 giant steps. And so here's the coffee bean Earth, okay, picture. And here's the sun, which I tried to imagine sitting in the back of the room. How big would half a meter be? And I, I, I missed, unfortunately. But if this was a half a meter <laughs> in diameter, <laughs> okay, something more like that, a circle more like that in diameter, then I would take that coffee bean Earth, right? And I would take 100 giant steps. And so just for one second, think about where that would put me, you know, outside this room. So this incredible, you know, empty sort of space that, that um, in our solar system. And, you know, the first time I did this with the fifth grade class and they're running across the playground, I thought, wow, you know, I, I learned these numbers when I got my PhD and, you know, I knew them, but I never had this gut feeling for how empty it is and why aren't there more planets in our solar system, for example? And that's one of the things that I want to talk about today. So if you look at the cartoon sketch of our solar system, you know, everything lies in a plane. Uh, and, you know, the outer planets 
stretch out. So now here are the inner planets, and the outer planets go way out here. About Uranus is something like halfway out in our solar system, d depending on how you want to define the end of our solar system. <laughs> and, and so you might ask, um, so are these planets, you know, are these stable planets in vast open spaces? Could you have dropped more planets in our solar system? Um, you know, why are they all on circular orbits except for Pluto, of course, which has been rejected as a planet? And I'm going to come back to these questions when I talk about one of the multiple planet systems that we found. So for now, just hold these, you know, these characteristics of our solar system in your mind. And then, of course, remember that if you scale, uh, compare the size of the planets to the, to the sun, again, the, the Earth being about a hundredth the diameter of the sun. OK, so that's all for the right through middle school review. Um, and then um, our sun appears to be just a completely unremarkable star. Um, maybe not completely typical. The most common stars in our galaxy are lower mass stars. So nature makes, you know, build very massive stars very infrequently. And there are lots of little, tiny, smaller uh, stars, about the, uh, half the size of our sun, half the mass of our sun. So our sun's, uh, but in any case, our sun's pretty unremarkable. It's like millions of other stars in our galaxy. And then, of course, you've seen this image of the Hubble Deep Field, which shows, you know, in a tiny square of the sky, part of the sky, you know, something like 10,000 galaxies. So there are trillions of galaxies in our universe, okay, each one harboring billions of stars in, in itself. Okay. So um, that's the background. And then, um, as Alan said, the field really began in 1995 when the first extrasolar planet was discovered. So we figured, we thought there would be planets around other stars, but I still remember in sort of 1993 people saying, isn't it a little odd that we haven't found any planets yet? You know, maybe they really don't exist. Maybe we're really it. That's it. Um, and since that time, the number of planets that we've detected has grown. And this plot shows the mass of the planets and then the numbers. So it's a histogram scale. And here we are in 2009, <laughs> okay, with something like 412, well, no, more than 400, almost 500. We're approaching 500 planets that have been identified around nearby stars. And uh, one of the interesting characteristics is that um, these guys are the easiest to find, the most massive planets, right? They induce the largest signals. And these are the most difficult planets to find, and yet they're the most common, clearly the most common, against all of our observational biases, which um, I thought Alan nicely portrayed as a kind of curtain over what we can't see, right? We just have to keep pushing that curtain back. Um, so this tells us something really important about planet formation, right? Just this plot alone. So if you take a, a, some, a graph like this and think about it, it means that nature is not forming these 10 Jupiter mass planets very often. And that in the same way that the massive stars are rare, the very massive planets are also rare. The making smaller things is, is probably easier. So um, Ellen went through the de different detection techniques. And um, I'll focus mostly on one technique um, which is the one that um, I use. It's the, the Doppler technique. And the idea is that, well, light is a, is a wave, right? You all teach this in your physics classes, I'm sure. And if you have a source that's moving toward you or away from you, there's a shift in the frequency of that wave. And then the way that I like to, again, explain it so that it's kind of visceral is that, you know, imagine that you're on a boat and the waves, you know, you're just sitting there with no motor on and the waves are kind of going by. And then you turn the motor on in your boat and you drive, you know, um, into the waves. Then you hit the waves more often. And then you turn your boat around and you drive in the direction that the waves are going. And now you hit the waves less often, less frequently. So. Light is a wave. Light also, um, when an object like a star or is moving toward us, toward us or away from us, then the light becomes blue shifted or red shifted as we look at it. So uh, literally, if you could take a star and make it go fast enough, it would change color. Okay, it would go from being, say, a blue star to, towards being a red star if it could go fast enough because of the Doppler effect. Most of the velocities of nearby stars in our galaxies are much smaller than that. And so we see not a shift in the whole color of the star, but what we do see is a shift in the 
um, absorption lines in the star. So in this spectrum of a star, when I go to the observatory, this is what a star looks like to me. It's not one of those little uh, round white dots. It's um, literally a spectrum, and very much like a rainbow, right? Except this rainbow is something like 10 feet long physically. And so in the optics of our spectrometer, we chop up that rainbow and we stack the light on a CCD detector. And so now, what you see is not a continuous smooth uh, uh, wavelengths of light from the star, but there are these, it's kind of ratty looking, there are these missing uh, wavelengths of light right here. There's, uh, those two lines are caused by absorption of starlight from the sodium that's in the atmosphere of the star. Uh, in fact, this is the spectrum of our sun. Up here, hydrogen. Here, magnesium. Okay, And each one of these lines can be identified like this. Most of them are actually iron lines, not because the sun is mostly iron, but because there are lots of transitions for iron at optical wavelengths. So what we see is now as the star comes toward us or goes away from us, that these lines are shifted um, a little bit um, relative to the rest wavelengths. And that's because of the Doppler effect. So um, again, the cartoon sketch of this. Let's see, I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, I was afraid of that. So it's not running. For, oh, there we go. OK. Shows that um, a star orbiting a common center of mass. And you see this very exaggerated sort of shift in the spectral lines. And so we go to the observatory, and we measure night after night, year after year, until we see one complete period, OK? The, the lines shift back and forth one full orbit of the star. And that's what we measure. Now, when you look at this, it looks pretty easy, right? Like, you could set this up in your <laughs> lab. But in fact, the shifts that we're measuring, um, you know, as Alan said, the Jupiter induces a reflex velocity in the sun of something like um, 12 or 13 meters per second. OK? And so uh, this causes a shift in a stellar line, which is a couple of pixels wide on a CCD detector. That's about one one thousandth of a pixel shift. Okay, and so if you want to find even smaller planets, then that shift goes down to one ten thousandth or one one hundred thousandth. All right, we're going from shifts that are hundreds of molecules in our silicon detector to looking for shifts that are a few molecules in our silicon detector, and that gets to be quite difficult because. Yeah, it is. <laughs> OK. So um, I, I checked in the back of the room, because Alan reminded me that during my, my talk, the planet count was ticking by. And indeed, I had to update my slides. So 412 is the current count for this technique, the Doppler technique. The number of planets that have been found by transiting method is something like 71 now. And we really expect that Kepler is going to roll out huge numbers of transiting planets in the next year or two. Um, the microlensing folks have found about a dozen um, exoplanets. Um, and someone asked the question, what would our, OK, if we were using a technique, we lived on another star, like, say, Alpha Centauri, and we had a telescope and a spectrograph, and we were looking at the sun, what would we see? Wh which of the planets would we see with our current, current techniques? And uh, as Alan said, if the planets were perfectly aligned in a plane, right, along our line of sight, then we could hope to pick up some transits. If we were using the spectrometer that I use, um, say, radial velocity measurements at Lick Observatory in California, um, then we might expect to see a couple of wobbles. Um, so here's the velocity of the sun uh, with time. And I plotted two theoretical curves. All right, <laughs> theory is good. <laughs> and so the theoretical curves have uh, an amplitude of about you know 12-ish meters per second, and a period of about 12 years for the blue curve, and that's from Jupiter. Okay, so that's a, that's the wobble we would expect in the sun if we were looking at the sun more or less you know in the plane uh, of the of the planets. Then if we look for a longer time, we would see that these velocities would be modulated by a longer period trend, the, the red dashed line, which has an amplitude of only of less than three meters a second and an orbital period of about 30 years. And that, of course, is from Saturn. 
And so this is the great thing for these multiple planet systems. The reason that we can disentangle each of the signals from each of the planets is that they have different orbital periods, okay? Because of Kepler's law, the planets that are further out take longer to go around. And so they show up in a Fourier analysis with different frequencies. Now, I put onto the theor theoretical curve the actual observational data, which is not so pretty, right? And I think you'd be hard pressed looking at this to say you could detect Saturn. Even if you, all right, observe for 70 years, <laughs> um, it would be hard. You, you, you would clearly see Jupiter. But in fact, our mathematical analysis pulls out the second signal quite easily. So it's not, we can't see it by eye very well, but um, it's there. And then um, Ellen talked about this, uh, the curtain uh, in our data. And in fact, our projects have been going on since, you know, sort of the mid-1990s. So we have something like 15 years of data. And so if you were observing this, the star, the sun, from Alpha Sen for something like 15 years, this is all you'd see. All right? And so that's why it gets complicated to understand or to detect the things that are far away. Uh, and of course, the things that are small because they induce a smaller velocity in the star. Okay, so now that you've had the lesson in how to find exoplanets, <laughs> right, <laughs> quiz time. How many planets um, are orbiting this star? Anyone want to hazard a guess? <laughs> More than one is a really good answer, <laughs> right? And you can see that there's something high frequency, short period going on. And you, but you can also see by eye this kind of a thing going on, right? And if you, if you uh, again, carry out the mathematical analysis, which is something that I did in 1999 um, for this system, then you find that, in fact, there are three planets there. And this was a bit of a surprise. We <laughs> knew early on uh, uh, Jeff Marcy and Paul Butler had found the, the closest planet in a four-ish day orbit, 4.671 days. And they could see the long period trend in the same way that you might see you know, the sun beginning a long period trend because of Saturn. Um, but that and this outer orbit closed um, when, I, when I began to model the data. And then the surprise was that there was one more planet that was nestled in there, actually. And so this is the star Upsilon Andromeda. And it was the first time that we had found um, a multiple planet system. And it was a little bit of a surprise. I remember people saying, wait, no, this is not right. We found a dozen single planets around stars, okay? Next, we should be finding double planet systems. Then we should find, right, it should go in some kind of an order. But, you know, this is what nature um, dealt. Um, and this was an amazing system. Because at the time uh, that we found it, I began to learn more about our own solar system and the stability of the planets in our own solar system. And in fact, these vast empty spaces are not so right, empty uh, as you might imagine. If you try to, in the scale model of the solar system, to drop another little you know, peppercorn or coffee bean planet in the solar system, the other planets take notice they're gravitationally perturbed, and the whole system becomes chaotic. So, in fact, um, Jack Lissauer at MIT and Jacques Lascar in uh, Paris have both run models on our solar system, which suggests that we're on the verge of stability, okay? Um, and that means something important in terms of planet formation. I think that means that we start out in the, in the story of planet formation building hundreds or thousands of planetesimals, right? And they compete for gravitationally stable niches and, and settle into this environment that's, you know, stable, but not, not, too, uh, not, not, ex not exactly empty. Okay, and so this was the interesting parallel with this system, Upsilon Andromeda, because um, the theorists began to model the system and they tried dropping moon-sized particles in and the whole system fell apart. So it showed that this was a system that, at least in the inner part, seemed to be dynamically full of planets, Okay, a characteristic which we share in our own solar system and which I think is profoundly important when you ask the question, 
do you think there are stars that don't have planets, as one of you asked? And Ellen uh, said, uh, you know, you've got to, to do that. I think you have to get rid of the planets. So planet formation is just this natural consequence of star formation, and probably most stars form. So it turns out that these multiple planet systems aren't just an odd curiosity. Um, something like 30%, 50%, um, we actually empirically observe uh, additional planets in the system. And knowing how easy it is to hide planets, right, um, it's, it wouldn't be a surprise if, in fact, most solar systems were not only had a planet, but had multi-planet architectures. Um, so this was kind of um, a, a cute story because when this uh, system was found, um, here's the star, okay, the artist's rendition by Lynette Cook, the star with the inner planet, the first one found by Marcy and Butler, the outer planet, uh, which we found, and then the surprise inner, you know, in-between planet. And so when the story was published in 1999, um, a, a class of fourth graders sent me a letter and they said, you know, we've been studying astronomy in our class, building, you know, scale models of the solar system. And our teacher brought in this story about Upsilon Andromeda. And so we wondered if you'd named any of the planets yet, because, of course, they had suggestions. And they, <laughs> they thought that the, um, the outer planet, which was four times the mass of our Jupiter, should be Forpiter, which was a great name, right? It's perfect. And then this one, which is two times the mass of our Jupiter, Jupiter, of course. <laughs> and then the little one that orbits in just four days is only uh, something like three quarters the mass of our Jupiter, which would make it how many Earth masses? Test, test time. Do, do, do. <laughs> three quarters of 300-ish, you know. So it's still, right, pretty big. So they named that one Dinky anyway. <laughs> um, and those names kind of stuck with some history. Um, so, um, in any case, lots of planets were being found in the 1990s, and as Alan said, um, I think people were skeptical about the interpretation because they're unseen planets. They remain unseen, except uh, we did know that one in ten of the close planets would transit, and indeed, uh, in 1999, um, as described, uh, HG209458 transited across the face of its host star at exactly the time predicted by the radial velocity measurements. The starlight did ever so slightly, uh, confirming uh, this, this, the Doppler observations from a new perspective. And so I think that's a theme that we all appreciate and think is important, that there are many different techniques that are beginning to uh, intrude on the parameter space of extrasolar planets in different ways and build together, piece together a coherent picture of what kind of architectures exist. So... Um, I took out all my slides on the other techniques because they were so well described. Um, but I wonder, I find myself wondering, you know, uh, as Ellen said, the thing we really are interested in is whether or not there are other Earths. And there are good reasons to think about that. So of these techniques, microlensing, which has found two plan or 10 planets, sorry, uh, transits with Kepler, so far five, many more to come. Transits with ground-based telescopes, about 66 um, planets. Doppler observations, 412 imaging, uh, something like 11 planets. How many of these, how many, uh, of these techniques can find Earths? And which of the techniques will find many Earths? Because we, what we care about is finding planets that, that show some sign of life, right? And you, we can probably bet that not every one of these Earths are going to show some sign of life. And so as a, just a number to throw out there, I would say we want to find 100 Earths, all right? We're still trying to find the first you know, real Earth, but we want to find a hundred so that we can really begin a systematic survey and figure out how often some kind of life might exist on these um, planets. So, um, so I've, we all in, in my field have considered uh, pretty hard uh, whether or not we might be able to find Earths with the Doppler technique. And it's, uh, it's a non-trivial exercise. Um, but somebody's got to do it, right? We're trying to beat down, literally beat down the noise. 
Uh, and so uh, to do this in the most efficient way possible, although it's kind of amusing what efficient means in this field, um, we went to the brightest, very brightest star, Alpha Centauri A and B, okay? A binary star system, right? But the stars are zeroth magnitude. I mean, everybody in the southern hemisphere looks up and sees Alpha Cent A and B, almost like we see Jupiter in the sky, you know, incredibly bright. Um, and, uh, and so here's, and, and it has a long history because it's so close of being observed. Um, the orbit is of the two star system, binary star system is well known. And here's the configuration. So here's the orbit projected into the plane of the sky. Um, and from 1990 to 1910 to 2010, where we are right now, um, this shows the orbit of the second star, B, as seen from the first star, A. All right, so the orbit of the binary star system is about 80 years. Um, and at closest approach, they come within about um, 12 AUs of each other. All right, so that's pretty close. A little crazy, maybe, for looking for planets. So, um, however, uh, people have run simulations, theorists have run simulations, um, showing that if planets exist around either A or B, there actually is a zone that's about two AUs wide, one AU being the Earth-Sun distance, okay, about two AUs wide around either star. I kind of actually sh uh, photoshopped that in here as these little green halos around the stars. Okay, so if there are planets within the little green halos, again, which is almost out to Mars's orbit in our solar system, they're actually dynamically stable. They, they survive. Um, and so we ran some simulations. Uh, Greg Laughlin, Laughlin with his student Javier Agundes ran uh, simulations of planet formation and detectability for Alpha Cent A and B before we started the project. And they started out with um, what in a science talk I would say is a John Chambers-like uh, simulation. John Chambers did this work, I think, when he was at uh, DTM, uh, where Alan is, and put in uh, hundreds of little moon-sized particles okay, in the simulation. And now, um, so kids get this because, right, Sim City, Sim, all the different Sim games, you've got these planets stretched out here, and now you let them go. And what they feel is the gravity of the star that they're orbiting and the gravitational interaction of the other planets. So in your simulation, if two of these objects get close enough together, you just make them stick, okay? We don't really follow the thermodynamics of the merge, merger. Um, you just simply empirically make them stick. And so what happens is that some of these small particles get tossed out of the star system, some fall into the star, and others merge to form larger planets. So you can see the evolution from the beginning at zero million years in the first panel to 10 million years, 20 million years, and down here to 200 million years when we end up with something that actually looks a, a bit like the Earth. I think the big dot, the dot size is scaled to the mass of the planet, and the big dot is something like a little more than one Earth mass, 1.1 Earth masses. And so you see these other arrangements. Now, this is one simulation. There were hundreds of others. Um, this process of planet formation is chaotic. If you change the velocity vector of one of those particles in the beginning, you end up with something that's different at, at the end. And I think that's really what's going on um, in, in planet formation. So in any case, we think it's, it's reasonable that you could end up with you know, something like a solar system and that those planets would survive for billions of years in orbit around Alpha Centauri A or B. So now what would it take to detect them? Because we've looked, we know that there aren't any Jupiters there, there aren't any Saturns there. Okay, um, and so the only thing we're looking for are really these little Earth-like planets from sort of Mars mass to Earth mass planets. And so we ran some simulations that assumed bad weather, mechanical downtime, uh, and so forth, and found that it would take 90,000 observations over, with a precision of three meters a second, okay, to sort of beat down the noise floor so that we could get to something like a, an a two centimeter per second precision, okay, in the Fourier transform. So now, this is something with three meter error bars that we're never gonna see, you know, a, a two centimeter or 10 centimeter signal, which is what we're trying to find, all right? But it will be buried there in the noise if and only if 
the noise sources from the, from the star are, are what we would call white, right? They don't have some frequency signal themselves. And that might not be the case. Um, we know that stars uh, well, uh, vibrate, they, right? Corot and Kepler are following the astroseismology of the stars. But most stars, stars like Alpha and A and B, will have uh, pulsation periods that are five minutes. So with 90,000 observations, we're going to plow right over that. That's not a worry. Um, but are there other noise sources in the surface of the star that have periods of you know, months? If that's the case, then we're in trouble. Or is there something in our instrument right, that's going to cause us trouble? And so uh, for all these reasons, uh, this project has been dubbed Project Long Shot. I just hope and pray that I don't end up a, a Peter Van de Kamp in somebody's story, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. The, the ultimate theorist's revenge, right? <laughs> Uh, but, you know, I, I, think, I think it's something that we have to do, um, not just because it would be exciting to find the planets, but because we're really trying to understand the noise sources in our Doppler technique. We're really trying to figure out how well we can average down noise to find uh, really small, uh, low-mass planets. And, you know, if the answer is no problem, you can do it with 100,000 observations of Alpha Sen, then we think about building a bigger, I'm using a 1.5 meter telescope at, at Cerro Tololo. We build a bigger telescope dedicated to Doppler planet searches, right? And just pound away here on Earth where we've got hundreds of years to follow these stars and beat down the noise. So it would be a, a tractable technique then that would be pretty thrifty when you compare it with the you know, several billion dollar missions um, anyway that were described by Alan. Um, so the challenges are many and profound. Um, the, the one thing, as I said, that I worry about are velocity uh, noise sources from the, from the surface of the star. So here are two pictures of the sun, one taken at ultraviolet wavelength um, bands and the other in visible bands. Uh, and you can see that, at least in the ultraviolet, the sun has a lot of velocity fields, right? There are flares and flows on the surface of the sun that are moving at speeds of kilometers a second. And we're trying to find a dynamical shift in the center of mass that's centimeters per second. So um, that's what makes this hard, one thing that makes this hard. Uh, my perspective is that in 1997, um, when we were, people were getting sort of you know, 3, 5, 10 meter per second precision, then I would ask uh, people, well, why? Why can't we do better? And the answer was, oh, we're hitting the, the floor of the stellar noise, right? So we're not going to do better than that because it's the star. And then, you know, we got to two to three meters a second, and then the stellar noise of the star was two to three meters a second. And then we got to, you know, one meter a second, and some people are doing below that, and they say the reason they're not doing better is because they've hit the floor of the stellar noise. And so it would be really good to push past the floor of the stellar noise, right, and see what the stellar noise really looks like. So I'm not sure we can do it, but we're certainly trying. Um, and we're building, in fact, a new spectrograph, which is going to be commissioned uh, in December, November, December of this year, uh, which will be much better than the instrument we're using right now. I'll talk more about that. Uh, okay, and the other interesting thing is that if you look at this, right, in the ultraviolet, things are bad. There's a lot of, uh, the, the lines are moving pretty fast. At visible wavelengths, it's smooth. In the red are wavelengths. The star is even more, looks even more homogeneous because the contrast between the spots and the photosphere of the star go way down the redder you go. Okay, so high contrast, okay, low contrast, even lower contrast at redder wavelengths. So we're also thinking about how we could, um, you know, extend our, our analysis to encompass redder wavelengths. And we might see a difference there that's, um, that's caused by spots versus not spot, no spots. Um, the other challenge is uh, theorists, because they, they, they tell me that, okay, you can run the dynamical simulations, all right, and it, it's true that they will, the planets will survive, but you could have never formed them in the first place. And the reason is that when the, when the picture that we have is that as the star is forming, it first collapses from this giant cold cloud of molecular gas and dust, 
<clears throat> settles down into a disk, and all the material in the star actually flows through this disk towards the central gravitational well, and then uh, continues to pile up there until the, the central object becomes a star. It achieves high enough mass that the pressure at the, at the core of this object can fuse hydrogen um, and provide some hydrostatic equilibrium pushed back on the force of gravity. Um, and then the stuff that's left behind is the debris disk, right, where the planets form. And so this is why all the planets in our solar system are in a plane, because they, they started out this way, and they inherited that, that geometry. Okay, but now if you take, uh, so this is, people think, something like 100 AUs perhaps, right? And if we take a second star and plop it down so that it closest approach, it comes within 11 AUs of the other star, well, that's got to be have a big impact on the disk. And so every time I would submit my NSF proposal uh, to look for planets in, around Alpha Cent A and B, then uh, Philippe Thébault, actually, who is a theorist, would say, uh, publish a paper that you know planets could never form around Alpha Centauri A, planets could never form around Alpha Centauri B. <laughs> There's no animosity, but. <laughs> <laughs> Right? <laughs> you heard it from the master. <laughs> so, um, in fact, we have counterexamples where planets have been found in binary systems that are as close as Alpha Cent A and B. And they're not just little garbage planets like Earth, right? Little rocky debris, whatever. They're big gas giant planets. So, um, that's, I think, fairly impressive. Um, I think another challenge is that <clears throat> we're using a vintage spectrometer. When we started the project, we knew exactly what star we wanted uh, for all sorts of reasons that I could discuss, but uh, we, Alpha Centauri A is, and B are visible in the southern hemisphere, and we had to go south. So we found a, a telescope that was just about to be shut down, the Sarah Tololo 1.5 meter telescope, um, and we sort of resurrected this old uh, spectrometer that had been retired, decommissioned in fact, and fiber fed it. And we've been using this uh, spectrometer for the last two years to collect our data. So that's why we're, we have uh, NSF, actually MRI, stimulus funding to build the, the new uh, spectrometer that will replace this one um, soon, we hope. Okay, so, um, Anyway, I think this is a, a long shot, but somebody has to do this. We need to understand what the floor of the velocity data are. And so here you can see we are up at the observatory trying to put things together and make this uh, old instrument work, uh, building all of the parts that we need for precision Doppler work. And you know, every night, every morning, I should say, um, I get an email with, here are your 500 observations from last night. So we have 200 nights of telescope time a year on this little 1.5 meter telescope, and we're running all night, every night, that the two stars are up, trying to really beat down, um, again, the noise sources in the star. And so uh, the velocity measure measurements are streaming out. We see this beautiful you know, binary orbit in the primary star. And now the question is, and it's going to take a couple more years, to find out whether or not in this band of velocity measurements that we have, we're able to mathematically extract a tiny little uh, 10 or 20 centimeter signal. So um, I call it long shot. You know, Frank Drake estimated that his chances of finding extra extraterrestrial signals were somewhere between 25% and one in a million. <laughs> okay. So... <laughs> I, I have tenure now, so I can do this. <laughs> Something to be said. And so uh, anyway, uh, I just want to end by thanking um, the lot, many people who have helped with really what's an overwhelming task from the telescope operators to um, my colleagues and, and support scientists and students um, have been amazing. So I'll just open for questions now. Presentation. Thanks. We'll open the floor for questions. Yes. How far down into the uh, infrared can your CCD detect uh, photons? Um, to about 9,000 angstroms. Um, yeah, 9,000 angstroms. So not into the, not the, the near infrared. 
And the problem, yeah, there are spectral lines. The problem is that then you start to hit the telluric lines. So, you know, we use this iodine cell, which I didn't talk about, but the, the way that we measure shifts in the stellar lines to, you know, uh, a thousandth of a pixel are because we imprint thousands of absorption lines from an iodine cell right into each spectrum that we take. And that spectrum, that iodine is fixed in our lab and we're looking for the stellar lines to shift back and forth with respect to it. But we're also looking through another kind of a iodine cell and it's our atmosphere. It's not iodine of course, but it's telluric lines, OH lines and so forth. And they become very dense um, as you go to infrared wavelengths. So we're, we're trying to stay away from that. Uh, when you were talking about the stability of the solar systems, that uh, it is on the verge of being stable, if we throw some uh, moonlight uh, masses, they fly apart. Are you referring to our solar system? Or? Yes, our solar system, right. Um, and so in something like four billion years, um, Jim Casting will tell you we're going to get into trouble far before that, before four billion years. But in something like four billion years, uh, I, I, the simulations have shown that one of the planets in our solar system will probably be ejected. I'm trying to remember if it's Mercury or Mars, I can't remember. The, um, if I remember correctly, um, the Centauri system has a third star, yeah, Proxima. Yeah, Proxima, well. that's right. And so uh, A and B, I think, are relatively close to the solar mass of, of our sun, and Proxima is like 0.2 or something like that. Right. Do you eliminate your search for Proxima because it's so small, or is it just that um, it's, it's too faint? Too yeah. Faint. yeah, it's an M dwarf. It's ninth magnitude. Well, it's, it's t way too faint, and so we could never get the signal that we need, right, to get 90,000 observations. It's mm -hmm. it's a race to get you know so many observations, and I can get 500 observations tonight on Alpha Centauri A, which is you know the brightest star. 400 on Al no 300 on Alpha Centauri B, and you know one or two on Proxima, so right. Proxima gets dumped. Yeah. I, I seem to remember a law called Bode's Law, uh, where p planets' positions were predicted. Right. Is there any chance of see? is that a valid law, first of all, and is there any chance of seeing that when you look at this three-planet system? Uh? So Bode's Law was revisited when, with the Upsilon Andromeda system, and people have talked about it. I, I think what we see going on is, you know, it might empirically describe our solar system, but it's not a universal law. The, uni the, the What we understand now is a lot more sophisticated that the, this whole process of planet formation is very chaotic, and you just end up with some natural separation, all right? If the planets weren't separated by a certain amount, which scales with their mass and distance from the sun, um, then they would be un in unstable orbits and they wouldn't survive. So the things that survive are forced to be in a so kind of natural spacing. And that's Bode's law, uh, observed that. But it's not in itself a fundamental law. Yeah. Um, Follow up. Just in that context, it's interesting to know that there is a journal called Icarus, which refuses to sec accept any papers which are purport to explain Bode's law. So it's not something which theorists consider seriously, unfortunately, these days. It really seems to be just a chance uh, that our solar system fits that law so well. Do we know uh, maybe from photometry uh, about the sunspot cycle of these stars that they don't hit the four or five years? Do we know the rotational periods? And do we know if their rotational axes are closely aligned with their orbital? Right, good, good question. So um, let's see, so the stars have been observed photometrically for a long time. One of the issues is that because these stars are so blazingly bright in the sky, um, the precision photometry um, is really good, but it's maybe, it's a little more difficult because you need to have a comparison star so that you can measure changes and there aren't any good comparison stars, except Alpha A and B themselves. So you can do relative photometry on them and it's, it's good. Um, let's see, your second question, we know the rotation of the stars, we measure uh, the rotation period um, and, well, V sign I, the broadening of the spectral lines, and, and it's c consistent with the uh, stellar spin axis being perpendicular to the equatorial plane of the binary star orbit. And all of the simulations that were run for planets, interestingly, force the planets to be in the plane 
right? The planets don't survive unless they're nearly in the plane of the binary star orbit. And that's a key thing because that binary star orbit is oriented like that, okay? And so we're going to get most of the M sine I, we're going to get most of the mass of the planet. That was another driver for the project. Deborah, there are these things called laser combs that the physicists have been working on that might eventually replace the iodine cells right. and whatnot. Is there a chance that those things will allow us to get more yeah. precise, pre precise measurements? Yeah, indeed, I, I have an NSF proposal in for a laser frequency comb. To, and what I uh, want to do, working with people at Harvard and MIT who have been pioneering this, but also in Colorado, is um, actually impose a laser frequency comb. So the, the iodine lines go from 500 nanometers to 600 nanometers. If I can put a laser frequency comb in from 600 to 700 nanometers, then I've got some prediction right on, on star spot behavior. Um, and I've extended the wavelength coverage. And yeah, it's going to be, I think it's fantastic and very exciting and also probably five years away, but yeah. So which do you want to do more? Do you want to find a planet around these stars, or do you want to lower the, the uh, stellar uh, interference? Wow, that is a really You can good only question. do one. I, I, <laughs> you're looking deep into my soul. <laughs> OK, if the planets are really there, I want to find them. <laughs> I don't want to be fooled. Um, I mean, you know, when, when um, Oh my God, what's the movie? Avatar just came out, right? And, and James Cameron put these gas giant planets around Alpha Centauri A. I mean, they, the reporters were all calling and we said, no, you know, that, that, that one doesn't exist. So, no, we want to find them because, look, if we find Earth-like planets around our nearest neighbor, that's going to completely change the face and the focus of NASA. I seriously believe that, you know, once we do that, I don't have my cell phone with me, but that, you know, we'll be engineering these little cell phones sized, you know, robotic spacecraft to go to the Alpha Sun system, you know, maybe traveling one one hundredth the speed of light. I don't care. That's only 400 years, right? <laughs> 10% of the speed of light gets you there in 40 years. And you, we, we can have a hope of maybe, you know, seeing this, is actually seeing our, our nearest neighbors. So it's going to be really important. Just out of curiosity, do you have the newest NASA app that shows the uh, the sun? No, I don't. Okay. And I'll get it. The sun that feeds directly onto onto your phone. Yeah, a lot of my okay, students I'll, have that. Okay, I'll have my I'll have yeah. my 16 year old son download that for me. <laughs> Good. I got. It. Uh, most of your inferences and results are based on a technique, so they, have, they are limited and depends on the sensitivity of the technique. How can you draw a conclusion that the nature behaves in a manner it does based on the results that are technique specific? So uh, the question, why, how can we tell that nature behaves as it does based on, okay, so when you say nature behaves, what do you mean, the planet mass distribution or the? Oh, sure, absolutely, absolutely. So whatever's behind the curtain, you're right, it's completely unseen. And we have to be really careful about that, that we, we don't, what we don't know that we're sure, you know, that we say we don't know that. But we're trying to erode, you know, chip away at the problem, sort of one planet at a time and, and bringing in different techniques to look at things from different perspectives so that we can just, we're, this is the beginning. You're seeing the birth of a new science. So yeah, there's a lot of growing pains and there's a lot of growth still to happen. Does that help or answer your question? Okay. <laughs> I think I'm up, okay. <laughs> I've always wondered, and I, I've never really been able to find any information on this, what exactly, in your opinion, caused it, let's say our solar system, the giant molecular cloud to start the rotation? Oh yeah, oh, conservation of angular momentum. I understand it, but oh, yeah. what, what is it that gave the angular momentum to the... To right, the okay, okay, so in the beginning, right, uh, oh God, I said that once. <laughs> <laughs> I was at the Vatican Observatory and I gave a talk and I said, in the beginning, and I realized, oh, <laughs> this is really good. 
<laughs> okay, so, but yeah, when, you know, when you start out with this cold molecular cloud, the particles aren't just sitting there, right? Everything has some kinetic energy. And so if you built up a velocity vector map of all of the particles in the cloud, you would see that on average, some direction, it, it doesn't perfectly average out. It's not completely zero when you add up all the velocity vectors. And so now as it begins to collapse, um, then the, there's some net angular momentum for, from the cloud that begins to spin up because you're decreasing the radius of the cloud. Right, right. So it could be absolutely that what starts, starts, you have to be, you have to in this cloud, because the clouds existed for a long time as just a cloud, right? So maybe what you're saying is what triggers it to stop being a cloud and start collapsing? And that's that you end up with some region that's dense enough, right? It's, a, it's called the genes criteria, where you have a high enough density that it can actually begin to collapse under its own self-gravity. And that could indeed be triggered by a passing star, right, which just ripples the density through the cloud a little bit, or, yeah. Theorists know better than I. <laughs> yeah, I'm wondering if there's another, you know, sort of uh, call it, uh, uh, well, we'll say a, a helpful uh, analog to what you're doing. If you got into the infrared and just looked at dust distributions, right. might you see magnetism, maybe knots of magnetism associated, you know, in between these two binaries that might indicate oh, uh, yeah. something? I'm yeah. just wondering about that. Okay, well, these two binaries are a bit of a problem because they are so bright. It makes it difficult to actually look at them and disentangle the point spread function of the instrument and so forth. So it's a little, it's challenging for imaging. But there are, of course, a lot of observations. One of the teachers here has a Spitzer project that she told me about. So observations looking in the infrared for dust around stars. Because the dust that we see around stars that are like the age of our sun is not primordial dust. It's not dust that from that protoplanetary disk. It's dust that, uh, that came into existence because objects like comets and asteroids collide. And when they collide, they break apart and they form this dust. That dust has some lifetime and it drains into the star, so it has to be replenished. So when you see dust around like mature stars, normal adult stars, it, it means that there's something there that's colliding and generating that dust. And that is a signature of, of planets. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to comment. On the angular momentum of the cloud, the okay. cloud is in the galaxy, and the galaxy is rotating, so it's, right. it's virtually impossible for the cloud not to have angular momentum to begin with. Right. Of course, then you get back right. to why is the galaxy rotating. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Other questions? Let's thank Deborah once again for one <laughs>